Lakeland Public Television presents Currents. Hello and welcome to Lakeland Currents. I'm Bethany Wesley. Tonight we are going to discuss the Northern Dental Access Center, a nonprofit dental clinic in Bemidji that serves low income families and individuals enrolled in Minnesota health care programs. The Northern Dental Access Center currently serves up to 80 patients a day. Since opening in 2009, the number of annual patients has increased steadily from 2,200 in its first year to 17,000 last year. The center has already expanded its operations three times and is now working to raise support and funds to allow for the construction of a new, larger facility. In his bonding bill proposal, Governor Mark Dayton has included $6 million toward the $9 million project. And so tonight, I welcome to the program Jean Edivold Larson, the Executive Director of the Northern Dental Access Center. But before we begin our conversation, we're going to take a minute to watch a short clip from a Lakeland News report highlighting the Northern Dental Access Center and a few comments from two of its patients. Times are tough at the Northern Dental Access Center. We're bursting at the seams here. They help underserved patients from 25 different Minnesota counties, but only a fraction of the 60,000 rural Northwest Minnesota people who are enrolled in Medicaid. Last year, the Access Center served about 17,000 patients, and officials expect that number to grow even more in coming years. If we cannot expand the size of the building, if we cannot build on it, we're going to actually end up having to go down. We're not going to be able to pro provide even the the services for 18,000 people. Building a new center will cost $9 million in total, including a possible $6 million from a bonding bill that Governor Mark Dayton could soon sign. So state officials came in for a tour, heading through the building's small hallways and hearing about the issues the center faces. We are now turning away dentists. Before finally meeting the people who come from far and wide to get dental help in Bemidji, like Red Lake resident Joyce Graves, who recently found dentures here. If it could just make this one little grandma smile, I can't imagine how many more grandmas and grandpas are going to come out and come smiling through this process right here. Many underserved and disadvantaged people have some issues with trust. Never have seen that here because of the energy and because of the dedication and the commitment and, and their program. The presentation seemed to make an impression. Particularly low income populations, populations of color and American Indians have not good access to, to oral health care. And we know oral health care is so important to overall good health. So having this facility in northwest Minnesota is a, really a godsend to people who need that care. It's imperative for the people in this community, particularly the people on public health care programs, that they have access to strong resources for their dental health. While they wait for bonding money, the Access Center staff is moving ahead with the new building site. It was last week, went and signed the purchase agreement for it. And at this point, it seems safe to say they have backing in St. Paul. We're all in this together and collectively we can actually make a difference. So really are really supportive of what you're doing and congratulations on getting it this far. Let's get it the next month. Thank you. All right. In Bemidji, Jackson Bruner, Lakeland News. Well, Jean, you've been the executive director not only since the center opened, but you were also heavily involved in the planning for the facility. Can you take us back to those early days? What led you guys to first come together? Who was that initial group that started talking about this? Well, thanks for this opportunity to talk a little bit about Northern Dental Access Center. This has been an amazing journey um, starting more than 15 years ago. Um, if I recall, it was the school district that um, started with um, concerns to um, the, health the health systems and local dentists and public health about the number of children that were showing up in the aid offices of uh, uh, school elementary schools with toothaches. And uh, parents really saying there just was nowhere to go um, to, to get a dental appointment, especially if you were low income or if you were enrolled in medical assistance or Minnesota care. Uh, local dentists can only take so many of those uh, insurances because of the low reimbursement rates. And so more and more people were having to drive uh, farther and farther away for dental appointments and in fact would simply go without uh, for years until it was absolutely an emergency and then it would have to drive hundreds of miles. 
Public Health, uh, Mary Marshall was her name, at, uh, the director at the time, this is back in 2001, along with Dr. John Luth, who is a local dentist in our community here, but also a regional leader in the dental community. And then uh, uh, Merit Care, uh, for, uh, San Sanford now, but Merit Care at the time, uh, Warren Larson. So those three fellows um, and lady, um, got together over some brown bag lunches and said, this is crazy. People cannot get dental appointments. And in fact, Mary was able to pull a number of 5,400 patients per year that the county was paying to leave the county in order to find a dental appointment. And it was just reaching um, crisis points where, where it was a public health issue more than just uh, inconvenience. After a few brown bag lunches, they said, how do, we, how do we put this together? We have to do something. And of course, in this region, there just weren't a lot of resources. So they tried to get the word out about the um, importance of access to dental care for low-income folks and how big the issue was. They went to every uh, Rotary Club and Civic Group and uh, County Board in, in, in the region and to try and get this word out. And over time, more and more agencies that were seeing the same issue, whether it was uh, at, the, at the food shelf, at the soup kitchen, and the sexual assault programs, and, and all of these health and human service agencies were saying, yes, our patients, or our clients too, were having this issue. So they spent about six years planning, dreaming, benchmarking, uh, cash flowing, trying to find those resources that they could pull together to do something. And over that six years, um, I happened to be in the, uh, uh, at Bemidji State University as a graduate assistant for um, uh, organizational development, so strategic planning was sort of my thing, and grant writing, I did a little bit of that in my past. So I got the uh, privilege of uh, being able to help them walk through their strategic plan. And over the okay. course of about six years, they had enough money and enough resources to um, get a start on a building that is uh, now at 1405 Ann Street, it used to be an eye practice, and we started with four operatories in uh, uh, 2009 and as you mentioned expanded three times since then and uh, the the need has just exploded when you opened in 2009 and obviously there was a lot of people that wanted to see were you guys surprised at the need that it's grown as quickly as it has or no you kind of expected that as word spread more people would be coming hmm. It, it was really an unknown. Um, we had several people at the table who had seen this issue firsthand for years and said, oh, when you open those doors, you're going to get flooded. And others um, who were very conservative, looking at the cash flows, saying, oh, how is this really going to work? And we were having difficulty recruiting dentists. And of course, if you don't have dentists, you can't do anything. And so we thought um, we would start about two afternoons a week, part time. Um, with some volunteer help and within about 30 days we were full-time five days a week within 90 days um, we had blown our two-year strategic plan out of the water uh, and um, we have never had to advertise um, we've never um, tried to get the word out about us because the uh, people who work at all of those health and human service agencies across the region that I mentioned had so many of their own clients that needed that care that those folks just kept coming and kept coming. And we have registered 200 new patients every month since the day we opened and that number's never changed. Oh wow. It's, uh, it's just been an incredible journey, as I said. So if I'm understanding you correctly, the patients that you guys see, they were able in very small numbers to see local dentists and then were they going outside of Bemidji to try to get dental care, the ones that were seeking it out? There's, there's layers of issues in, uh, number one, we're in what's called a dental professional shortage area. Of course, dentists are retiring at a faster rate than new uh, dental students are graduating, especially in these rural areas. And so we already have a shortage, uh, whether or not you have dental insurance. Um, add to that that Minnesota, unfortunately, has, has just simply decreased the amount of reimbursements that it allows private practice dentists to, to get if they help or if they um, accept Minnesota care or medical assistance insurances. And so it became more and more difficult for them to have more than 10, 15, or 20 percent of their patient base have those insurances. Um, it just, they couldn't make a, make a living at it, and, and it's completely understandable. Um, so add that uh, to the complexity of, of the geographic distribution where uh, as far as people were uh, spread out over these small towns, um, for the most part people had to go to Grand Forks or Brainerd or Deerwood or Duluth 
Duluth to get a dental appointment at all. But it was because our local dentists were capped. They had taken as many as they could. And at the time, we had several of them around the table. Um, and we wanted very much to complement their work, not compete. Okay. And that continues to be a core value of, uh, of ours today, is to not compete with the dentist. We're simply here as a referral source. And so the front desk at any local office, it now instead of saying, no, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't help you, now they can say, no, we can't help you, but we know who can. And that, that's been a real relief. Oh, great. I want to talk a little bit about dental care in general. And some people see dental care as perhaps cosmetic or the you know, wanting white teeth, but it goes deeper than that. Um, you've seen, if I'm correct, that when some of your outreach teams have gone out, that the number of kids that have tooth decay is actually fairly high. It's, it's really interesting, and that was for that six years of just trying to understand the issue more and build awareness and to really um, remind ourselves that this is a public health issue um, and that much like um, uh, streets and roads and water treatment systems, access to dental care is part of an infrastructure that a community needs in order to maintain its public health. Um, uh, tooth decay is, um, number one, the, the bacteria that causes it is communicable. So a child can pass it from uh, child to child, grandparent to child, mom and dad to child. And so if tooth decay isn't, isn't addressed in adults, it can be handed off to children and children can give it to each other. Um, a tooth decay has also been connected with heart disease and diabetes and stroke. Um, you know, if you get that blood, uh, that plaque, you know, into your bloodstream, especially um, if you have a, an extra, a chronic illness, um, it can, it can be harmful. Another myth is that uh, a lot of parents think, well, they're just baby teeth, so that, so they don't really matter. And um, we're trying to really raise awareness that that those teeth set the foundation for the rest of your life. And if, if baby teeth are infected or diseased in some way, um, it can really set the stage for a lifetime of pain. Okay. And um, Minnesota, like many health indicators, Minnesota does really, really well. Unfortunately, where the biggest disparities are, are in low-income families and the uh, rural families. And they uh, bear most of the burden of the health disparities when it comes to oral health. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, when we went out, to, when we go out to schools uh, throughout the region, um, our last number was about 60% of children that would present with, a, with decayed teeth or untreated tooth decay. And uh, we, we would do our best to help those families find dental appointments in their own community or, or he, here at Northern Dental. Wow. Now, there's existing barriers to getting health care and oral health care in addition to just the insurance and the finances. For example, I mean, if you live an hour from Bemidji, if you don't have a great car, you don't have funds for gas, it's hard to get there. How does Northern Dental Access Center kind of confront and overcome some of those barriers? Well, I think one of the most interesting things about the way uh, th this clinic evolved over time was because there were not enough resources to make it happen quickly. Um, this group of stakeholders really had an opportunity to explore what is this issue really about? Because it isn't about dentists necessarily. Um, it, it's, it's about something deeper. And so we spent time talking to uh, low-income folks that were having difficulties getting these dental appointments to see what else is going on. And we learned quickly that there were these issues, as you mentioned, barriers to care, we sometimes call them. And so we said, well, how can we do this differently? Because obviously just access to care isn't the whole issue. And so we started um, leveraging each other's resources so that we could build in more of a safety net for these families that were struggling. What we've learned over time is that, uh, um, you know, if a family is, food insecure and, and, and unsafe and has no housing um, and is maybe having trouble with unemployment or is um, on and off in their enrollment for medical assistance or Minnesota care for various reasons um, or just simply transient. You know, the kids are in the Twin Cities half the year in their home half the year. All of those things, it, it, we've learned it's pretty arrogant for us to assume that a dental appointment that was made six months ago is the most important thing that day. And so to understand that the complex lives um, th that people in poverty and low-income families face um, is just about a whole lot more. And so we've put a, uh, what we call a circle of support services of, uh, for patients, and we have pa uh, transportation assistance available. So if folks are coming from an hour or two or more, um, we can assist them with that transportation 
we can supervise kids while uh, families are on site because sometimes that's a uh, that's a barrier. Um, we have access to mental health uh, screening and referral. We now have legal aid on site so that we have an attorney available because sometimes there are barriers to care that that um, an attorney can help resolve. We have public health for child and teen exams, immunizations, checkups, and those sorts of things, um, and insurance counseling. So we have two minsure navigators full-time on site because the Minsure um, online exchange can be a little intimidating <laughs> for families and uh, sometimes you can uh, get kicked off of your insurance for, for something that doesn't make a lot of sense. So we've got two people there to answer those questions and, and try and get things fixed as soon as possible. So what we've learned over time is, is that uh, circle of services combined with um, what a cultural competence that we really train hard on in our team to make sure that patients feel welcome and uh, that there's no judgment, that we really want to meet them where they're at, no lectures, um, just come and let's, let's address your health care. Um, those two things have really made a difference so that our patients want to come back, which not how many people want to go back to the dentist. Um, we've had kids scream in the chair and, and still not want to leave because they hadn't finished their coloring yet. So, you know, just trying to make this a, a great environment for families has, has been um, such a fun part of what we do. One of the things I had read since you brought it up was in your exit surveys, 98% rate their care as excellent or good but they also rate the facility as being a welcoming environment as excellent or good, which means that they feel like they're respected and cared for when they're there. How important is it for them to come back? How many of the patients that you see need to come back repeatedly? Many? Well, it's, there, again, the issues are complicated. Uh, medical assistance in Minnesota care really is a limited scope of services. And so if you have those insurances, um, the good news is you live in Minnesota and there are um, reimbursements available for certain types of dental procedures, but it isn't the full gamut of services. So we are able to provide what the state allows and um, it's uh, so one or two exams in a year for an adult, uh, two for children. But we experience, our patient base experiences the same issues that the schools face, uh, that employers face, and that's simply that people in poverty or low-income families um, are transient in some ways. They, they tend to move around because it's very, very difficult to stay stable. Um, but we do, we average about 1.7 visits per uh, patient okay. per year. Um, and if it's just a cleaning and exam, you don't need to come back. Uh, oftentimes, though, people haven't seen a dentist in decades, if ever, and the treatment plan may, re may require three, four, or five appointments. Um, we do provide dentures and partials. Many uh, access clinics don't do that, but we do. We're very proud of that. Um, we seat up to 40 uh, sets of dentures or, or, or partials every month, and so restoring those smiles um, has really changed the lives of so many people. Uh, so it's, people should come back, but they don't always. Yeah. This is a population that has been accustomed to dental care always hurting because it's not been available. And so you only go when it hurts. And if you wait until it hurts, then there's something wrong with the tooth. It's decayed already. And then of course, uh, that then you're gonna get a shot and you're gonna get the procedures that are more painful than a normal cleaning. Uh, that if you just go every six months, it's perfectly painless. And so it, the level of anxiety among people that have not had a dental appointment in a year, or two years, five years, ten years, um, they only know it to hurt. And so it's not easy to convince people that coming back just for prevention is important. As we move toward talking about the bonding request in the future, I want to focus a little bit more on the facility itself. So you opened seven years ago. You've already expanded three times. Was that something that you guys had anticipated needing to do at some point down the road, expansions? Was that built into the facility that you took over? There were, um, plen there were several rooms available that we just left alone when we first uh, moved in. So we were perfectly convinced that uh, the structure we were in was going to last us 10 years. Um, and uh, uh, two years ago, we took the janitorial closet and <sighs> turned that into the 12th operatory, and that's sort of the extent of the expansion. We leased this facility, as I said, um, and so that exponential growth that we talked about earlier, it's, it's, it took our 10-year plan and condensed it down into two. Um, and the, the need is still growing. There are 60,000 people enrolled in Medicaid right now in the region that we serve, 60,000. Wow. So if you consider that we serve 10 or 11,000 a month or a year, 
um, you know, we're still barely scratching the surface. And projections are that that number will be 70,000 by the year 2020, which I've just realized is not that far away. <laughs> so, uh, so we really need to be bigger. And, and I think the tipping point for us was uh, turning dentists away. If you would have said five years ago that we would be in a position where we're turning dentists away who are interested in working here, I would have told you you were crazy. Um, but now we have four and five dentists on site every day and I've turned away two that have said, we'd love to come and work um, a day or two a week. I'm sorry, just don't have the room. And so then you know it's time to get more space. Okay. So um, uh, the board of directors uh, two years ago set that as um, their, their goal was to build a new facility that's larger. And our current facility also has some weaknesses. It doesn't meet the ADA requirements. Parking is, is uh, very difficult. If you drive by on a busy day, you'll see us parking in the field and uh, in the snowbanks um, on the side in order to make enough room for patients. We're doubled up in offices. There's no room for staff uh, at all. Um, so there's a lot of other reasons, but um, simply to be larger uh, and get up to 18 operatories um, and partner with the School of Dentistry, which is a, a new partnership. Um, so there's great opportunity, and uh, yes, we have a bonding request uh, as we speak in front of the legislature, and we're holding our breath, hoping that by the 23rd of May, they will have approved that request, and uh, if that goes well, then we're challenged with raising some local match, and, uh, and then we will get started on building. So you said, 17,000 patients, or you said they're also called patient encounters. Patient encounters. Which means you could have seen the same patient yes. numerous times. Is it fair to say then that's kind of the top? Like you can't handle more than that a year in your current facility? You would think. Okay. <laughs> um, but each month that passes, um, our staff does something extraordinary, and that is they beat the previous month. Um, we have. Uh, something called lean dentistry, which is really, instead of a very linear process of scheduling, it's, it's more of an air traffic control. And the more efficient this team becomes, the more they're able to just squeak out a little bit more. So um, the month of March, uh, we went from an average of 1,200 appointments a month to 1,700 or 1,900 appointments per month. So we had a 25% increase over 2014, for 2015 and then we had another 25%, and we're now on track for another 25% growth. But you're correct. We, we cannot maintain that, that trajectory of growth. Um, we can only do so much. Um, the, the building is being uh, beat to death, <laughs> poor thing. It, and the equipment, the life of the equipment is, is, um, has been a real challenge. And so uh, we're squeaking out as much as we can in that facility. It's, been an, it's pretty amazing considering what we're working with. So you've made the bonding request. Um, Governor Mark Dayton has supported six million of it, which obviously had to be a big relief, a big, big happy news for you guys. What happens? How does the process lay out now for you moving forward? Well, we've spent um, two years uh, raising awareness, uh, building ownership statewide. I've been very, very pleased and impressed uh, and honored, frankly, with the level of statewide support that has um, uh, surrounded this project. And we've had visitors. We had two bonding um, tours in the fall of, of last year. And most recently, as you saw, we had the commissioners of health and human services here, which rarely happens out in the metro or in the rural areas here. So, uh, and the uh, authors of the bills um, cross both parties and they are from all over the state. Okay. Um, so we've done as much as we can. Um, we, we work with uh, the University of Minnesota. They have lobby efforts. We have um, different, uh, the, the uh, Minnesota Dental Association and other of our stakeholders that have lobbyists. We have lobbyists. We're down there. Um, we're told that, that every office people walk into, they say great things. Um, our Chamber of Commerce and their Bemidji Day at the Capitol was uh, very generous in allowing us to be one of the priorities presented at that, uh, during that day. And uh, so we've done as much as we can, and right now we're holding our breath. Mm -hmm. Commissioner uh, Piper, who was here, I, I said to her, we will come down and testify at any hearing you want, and her response was, nothing compares to walking through this building mm -hmm. and seeing our work firsthand. She said, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we're, we're living on that, but it, it, knowing how sessions go, it's likely we won't know till the last minute. If everything goes according to plan and if the dominoes fall as you hope they will, 
what is your timeline for opening in a new facility? Well, I'm sure it will take us um, a, a few more months after the vote, um, after the positive <laughs> vote, uh, it'll take us a few months to raise the match funds. Um, we're a little over halfway there. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, all going well, we would hope to break ground this fall. If it's a relatively mild uh, winter, um, we would hope to be uh, concluding construction by the end of 2017. Okay. Um, and any small barriers or bureaucratic snafus between now and then, it's possible it could go into uh, the spring of 2018. Okay. When you talk about match funds, can you talk a little bit about that? Because it's six million dollars through the bonding, which would leave three million for match funds. Right. Um, every bonding uh, project requires local match. Um, for the most part, it's typically a 50-50 match. Um, we are um, reminding uh, policymakers that um, our resources in this region for philanthropic support are a lot more limited than they are in the seven county metro area and so raising half is uh, a very very difficult challenge and so we've uh, requested that they consider a 70 30 uh, percent um, or, uh, ratio so that's how you get to the six and three um, and so we've had some very good luck with our uh, insurance companies, the Delta Dental uh, and Prime West Health, you know, those folks that, that um, are required to make sure that their enrollees have access to care. So we're getting um, contributions in a little bit at a time. Some are holding their breath to see how the bonding goes, um, which is perfectly fine, because, uh, but uh, we would still need to raise another, a little under a million and a half. Okay, interesting. Um, moving a little bit off of that, that topic, I want to talk a little bit about the economic impact that your facility actually brings to the area because it's not only from just Beltrami County or Hubbard County. Your patients come from 25 plus counties. Huh, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 uh, every time I look at the map, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm amazed. Uh, I think there's a myth that nonprofit organizations or uh, organizations that serve low-income people um, are, are a drain somehow on a community or on the taxpayer. And uh, it is important to remind ourselves that, that the opposite is true. Um, we have got 23 employees, full-time, livable wages, um, some of the highest uh, uh, job satisfaction that I've ever seen among the people that, that uh, are employed with us. We have um, a dozen different contract dentists who come, and they come from all over the state. They come from the range, they come from over by uh, Grand Forks, they come from the Twin Cities, St. Cloud, and they come for a day or two a week. Um, and some bring their families and stay at the state park for the summer. Um, and, and so those folks are coming into our community and then the reimbursements alone we're bringing in over two million dollars from uh, St. Paul and from Washington DC into our community and so that's you know it, it is an economic impact if you also add into the fact that by providing a dental home for to more than 12,000 people who don't didn't have it before we are reducing those uh, visits to the emergency room, so because uh, that's the most expensive health care that there is, um, and we don't. And so by reducing that, I think we also impact that worker productivity goes up, uh, education and the ability for a student to learn goes up. So there are sort of ripple effects of, of our work as well. Well, Jean, I want to thank you for joining us today. This has been fascinating, and I look forward to following your journey through the bonding process in the weeks to come. So thank you. Thank you for joining us today on this latest issue of the episode of Lakeland Currents. I'm Bethany Wesley. Thank you. Mm -hmm.